of these lectures uh, is to bring to uh, a more a wider audience the uh, interest and importance of legal history. Uh, and this event now uh, is uh, so uh, well subscribed that it is very possibly, in terms of global reach and numbers, the uh, largest single gathering of those with an interest in legal history ever. We're particularly fortunate tonight to have with us Professor Jay Tidmarsh, who is the client professor of law uh, at the University of Notre Dame in the United States. Uh, he has a particular interest uh, in uh, complex legal litigation and procedure. And it was because of that and during his study of that, that he developed an interest in the uh, fire courts, which is the subject of this evening's webinar. Uh, his learning on the subject is so extensive that it would quite easily fill much more than one lecture. Uh, and that would not uh, suit the process this evening. A webinar of this sort uh, would uh, not do justice to uh, that uh, type of approach. And so we decided to treat matters rather more informally uh, and uh, to have something more of a dialogue between Professor Tim Marsh and myself. The um, concept of this talk, the idea behind uh, having uh, uh, a webinar on the uh, uh, fire courts was conceived at the time of the terrible disaster uh, of the of Grendel Tower, where we had uh, a, a most awful fire in London and many, many lives were lost. Little did we know then uh, that there would be fire followed by plague, uh, and now we would be uh, dealing with uh, an even larger. Uh, disaster affecting far more people. Uh, and uh, in many ways, the situation which has arisen is rather more uh, like the situation that existed when the fire courts came into being in 1666. So, Jay, perhaps uh, if I could bring you in now, uh, and you could perhaps paint a picture for us, please, of what was happening in London in 1666 after and about the time of the Great Fire. Well, uh, thank you, Judge Krein, for being able to, to be here tonight. In a word, I would say that the situation in London in 1665 and 1666 is grim, uh, especially after the fire. It's not that there isn't a, a willingness to want to rebuild the city of London, but there are financial and legal impediments uh, to being able to do so. In fact, uh, at on New Year's Eve, as you know, uh, Samuel Pepys would often uh, take account in his diary of what the prior year had had been. And while he personally had uh, had a relatively good year, he noted with some despair in his diary on New Year's Eve 1666 that he thought that London was less and less likely ever to be rebuilt. Um, but it was rebuilt. And uh, I think it is in no small measure because of the uh, operations of the Fire Corp. Uh, and this is why I really look forward tonight to, uh, to having this conversation with you, Donald, about the Fire Courts, about what they did. And then, uh, as you said, London then, of course, it was plague and then fire. Uh, now it is fire and then plague. Uh, but to expand the conversation near its end, once we've had a chance to talk about the Fire Court and what it did, to have a chance to reflect on uh, what the lessons of the, something like the fire court might be for modern times. You know, my own thinking on that subject is uh, still uh, in formation and certainly I'd welcome your thoughts as well as those of the members of the audience. Uh, Donald, I think you may be muted. I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not able to hear you. I apologize. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I just say I was pleased that you were approaching it in, in that way and that you were rather more likely, to, uh, we're rather more likely to learn more from you than you are from uh, me. But um, can we then perhaps start if we're going to deal with it in, in, in that sort of order by setting the, <coughs> the picture of what London was like after the Great Plague and in the period leading up to the fire? Uh, how, how was London faring? You haven't been over, I know, but during uh, the uh, COVID lockdown, uh, if you went into the city, it was virtually empty. 
and he wouldn't be altogether surprised to see tumbleweed going down Fleet Street. Um, might that be uh, a, a reasonable comparison to, to how it was in uh, 1666? I think there are some comparisons. Um, so uh, the Great Fire uh, begins in, or see, I apologize, the Great Plague begins in London in April 1665. Uh, it's more or less run its course by uh, February to March of 1666. But uh, London had perhaps 450,000 people living in the uh, entire metropolitan area before the plague. Uh, we know from mortality bills that at least 70,000 people die in the plague. Uh, undoubtedly, just as today, uh, the actual mortality rate is considerably higher. So it's not unreasonable to think that as much as a quarter of the city of London has died between 1665 and 1666. So things like uh, uh, trade and business are exceptionally weak. Um, my understanding uh, is uh, that, for instance, the uh, uh, the Inns of Court, which would often have been regarded, I, I guess would be regarded as the third university of, of, of Britain at the time, uh, did not hold their traditional summer sessions uh, in 1665 and 1666, another uh, echo of today. Uh, the city of London itself was teetering at, on the brink of financial ruin at this time. Um, it had been engaged in deficit financing for a very long time. Its guild system, its ability to control trade in the metropolitan area was collapsing. Uh, roughly a quarter of its income, uh, its revenues came from rents and uh, the rental market had plummeted as a result of the great fire. Uh, so uh, there are considerable uh, pressures in the city. And then on top of all of that, uh, the Second Dutch War is going on. Uh, and at this point, the tide has begun to turn against England in the Second Dutch War. There are almost daily rumors of an invasion of the Dutch fleet, perhaps even into London itself. Charles II is in desperate need of money to outfit a number of ships, to replace a number of ships that he's lost in this war. He's putting exquisite pressure on uh, the city itself, as well as some of its wealthiest citizens for loans and grants. Um, and on top of all of that, the summer has been hot and dry. Uh, so it is uh, perhaps not the best of times in London. Well, a, a great fire like that could never come at a good time, but it, it seems that putting it in that context, it could hardly have come as a worse time, I suppose. No, I think that's right. Uh, you know, the, the devastation, uh, as, as everyone knows, the devastation from the Great Fire, this is this wonderful medieval city with its timber buildings, it, it was nearly complete. Uh, so the fire destroys about 13,000 or more buildings, uh, in addition to 87 churches and St. Paul's. Uh, it, it destroys about somewhere between 40 and 50 of the livery company halls, uh, the Royal Exchange, the Customs House, many of the other buildings in the city are gone. And of course, then it burns all the way down to the Inner Temple where uh, the Duke of York uh, and uh, his intrepid band of sailors uh, fortunately saves uh, the Inner Temple from destruction. So uh, so there's enormous destruction that the humanitarian uh, catastrophe that is presented by the Great Fire is enormous. You have tens of thousands of people people uh, living in fields outside of London. Um, so you know, this is also a catastrophe for the city itself, the city of London. Um, again, so much of its revenue is tied to rents and suddenly uh, its prospect of rental income has uh, quite literally gone up in smoke. Uh, this is a difficult problem for the rest of the country, uh, which trades with London. Uh, one of the small uh, features about uh, the Great Fire is that um, a number of merchants in the rest of the country had sent goods down to London, down to the Royal Exchange and surrounding buildings in anticipation of the, the Michaelmas sales. Uh, real tailors today are not much different than they were 350 years ago. They're looking for a good opportunity for a sale. And so uh, a lot of, uh, of material from the rest of the country went up in flames in London as well. So, um, but let me, I wanna focus on one particular aspect of why this was such a catastrophic fire. So this is the 17th century. Um, there, uh, uh, there is not a stock market. Uh, modern banks don't exist. Modern bond markets don't exist. Insurance doesn't exist. So uh, there are limited opportunities for people who have money to invest uh, in, in instruments that might uh, pay a reasonable rate of return. Of course, one thing that you can do if you're a little bit more of a gambler is you can invest in one of the 
uh, mercantile enterprises, usually sponsored by one of the, the, the livery companies. Uh, but, of that, but those are highly risky ventures. I think about the East India Company, for instance, would be one example of that. Uh, but there were many others. If you wanted a somewhat safer kind of an investment, the best way to do it was to invest in property. And, and this is the way it would usually work. You would find a property, uh, you would lease it, then you would turn around and sublease it to someone, uh, either uh, for an increased rack rent so that you would then get a stream of income guaranteed over a number of years, or maybe you would just take a large upfront fine, just get a large payment at the beginning that you could just immediately uh, you know, take some money out of it. And then this would happen uh, not only to the sub lessee, but then the sub lessee would then turn around and sub sublease it. And sometimes this would go down to uh, the fourth or even uh, the fifth lease. So uh, uh, on top of that, leases, uh, just like in modern times, uh, leases were used as a form of security against mortgages. They were used to create kind of a, um, an early form of an annuity in some instances. I might pay you, Donald, I might pay you 700 pounds and you would give me uh, the rents from uh, 100 pounds worth of uh, per annum property per year for the rest of my life. And you'd make a bet I would die before seven years and I would make a bet I would live longer than seven years. So you would have these kinds of annuity instruments. Uh, widows, uh, children depend on these rents. In addition to the city, there are uh, livery companies that depend on them, charities. Uh, the colleges of Oxford and Cambridge. So uh, the, the, much of the wealth of England is tied up in these properties. Um, and again, you know, remember it all at a time when England is at war and Charles also needs a lot of money and he needs it quickly. So um, that's the circumstance that the Great Fire poses for, for England. Well, Charles, Charles, obviously, yes, but presumably there are other vested interests as well as Charles who uh, are very anxious to see this, this this phoenix rise from the ashes as quickly as possible, but but where do you start when you face with so much devastation? Well, you know the, the, uh, the courts. Sorry, I apologize. Uh, yeah, no, I think you start uh, by whether or not uh, London is is to be rebuilt at all. And of course, you're right. Uh, the city that Charles uh, many interests have a vested interest um, in rebuilding as quickly as possible. Um, but you know, um, the, the difficulty is really not so much with the desire to rebuild. It's with just the practicalities financially. Where does the money come from? Uh, you know, obviously one of the difficulties is when the decision is finally taken to uh, rebuild London, but more or less on the same footprint with somewhat wider um, uh, streets and brick buildings and so forth. Uh, where does the money come from to compensate the uh, property owners who lose some property in the process of rebuilding? So we have all of those sorts of problems. Uh, but then in addition to that, we just have this, this rabbit's warren of property interests that need to be cut through. And unless and until they can be cut through, you can't start the rebuilding of London. And, and this is where law turns out to be particularly unhelpful. Uh, because nearly every one of these leases that have been executed contains a covenant, and that covenant requires the tenant to repair and rebuild the property uh, should anything occur from it, at, including a fire. So uh, ultimately, uh, because this would be in the original lease and the sublease and the sub sublease, uh, it falls upon the tenants in occupation to be the ones to try to rebuild uh, the properties. That's the way the legal arrangements work. But so I'm the tenant in possession. I've just been burnt out. My home's just gone. Very often in a medieval city, the home would be the workplace. Uh, the workshop has just gone. The stock's just gone. Um, I've had a pretty bad year uh, for the last uh, two years, at least, in terms of business. Um, financially, I'm probably in a pretty poor, poor state of uh, uh, for, for rebuilding. Where do, where do I find the money? What relief can I get? Can I look to the landlord for responsibility here? Can I look to equity for it? What can I do? Well, so I think uh, you can begin with uh, with whether you're going to go be able to go to the common law and find any relief there. And I, I just I'm just uh, I wanted to uh, put up on the screen and just share uh, briefly one case. And this case is actually a fascinating case about uh, uh, the rebuilding efforts in London for a number of reasons. But uh, this case called Paradigm versus Jane, it had involved a property that had been burned to the ground 
during fighting between royalist and commonwealth forces back in the 1640s. And the tenant uh, who is under a covenant to repair and rebuild the property makes the argument that I shouldn't have to because of you know, this fire, in essence, being out of my control. Uh, and yet you see in the opinion itself, uh, if I can uh, one second, get it, pull up just the, the particularly relevant passage out of it. Uh, the common law courts, uh, in essence, say no. Uh, even if your property be burned by lightning, even if it be torn down by an enemy, you are going to be responsible for the building of or the rebuilding of a property. So uh, there, I, I apologize. I think I might have uh, just finally gotten to share this. I might not have shared it before. So I'll. Uh, um, uh, let me just grab that first slide, just so you can, everybody can read that quickly. Uh, so uh, this is a, a fundamental difficulty. The common law courts are not going to help. You, you mentioned equity. It's not clear that equity is going to help either. Um, uh, obviously, common law is likely to keep the entire loss on the tenant. Uh, equity, if it were to help, would most likely then uh, throw the entire loss onto the landlord, uh, who may not be in any better position in many circumstances than the tenant to try to um, uh, to rebuild the property. So uh, in either direction, it's unlikely that the law or equity is going to help. And of course, I should always mention, as we all know, uh, equity is unlikely to be helpful in the short term. The need is to rebuild London as quickly as possible. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, uh, practitioners in equity who had made an observation in his diary suggesting that he thought that if these cases came into equity, as they undoubtedly would when the common law courts would provide no relief to the tenants, uh, that it would take at least a year for equity uh, to come to any resolution of the problem. And I think uh, those who understand equity in the 17th century know that that would be an extraordinarily optimistic view. Uh, it would be years that these cases would end up being tied up um, in in, uh, in litigation, and and uh, and in the meantime, if I am a landlord and you're a tenant, Donald, uh, you know you have very little reason to want to rebuild the property. Uh, you're going to be required to rebuild a property in brick, uh, a much better property than the property before. And if I've only got perhaps, uh, or if you've only got perhaps two or three years years left on your lease, you have very little incentive to rebuild your, that property when I'm going to be the ultimate beneficiary of most of the reconstruction that you've done. But the reconstruction, as I understand it, under the um, Rebuilding Act uh, required a very uh, serious piece of uh, uh, investment in terms of rebuilding in brick and in accordance with the building regulations uh, that were designed to uh, reduce the risk of fire in the future. So. Um, in those circumstances, what's going to provide the the tenant, the, the, the person you describe, um, with the uh, with the incentive and indeed the means to uh, build in accordance with the with the new legislation? And so this is the this is the genius of the fire courts. Um, so it, it takes about four months from the Great Fire until Parliament finally is convinced to act. Uh, it passes the Rebuilding Act, which again sets the basic template for, for modern construction in, in London. And then it has to deal with this problem of creating incentives. You're exactly right. Um, so uh, what it does is it uh, creates this, uh, this uh, fire court as a way to try to deal with the problem. Uh, let me again just share the screen quickly. I'll, I'll show you um, the uh, the fire court itself, this is just the uh, enabling statute in the fire court. The fire court is designed as a court to try to resolve disputes, resolve the differences between landlords and tenants, uh, all with the goal in mind of rebuilding the city as quickly as possible. And again, you know, the, the important thing to recall, of course, about either law or equity is that it is likely to throw the entire loss entirely on one party or the other, probably the tenant, but nonetheless, it's, a, it's an all or nothing kind of an approach where all the loss goes to, the, to one side or the other. The, 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 uh, the, the uh, wonderful thing about the uh, fire court, um, the legislation with respect to the fire court, is that it actually provides for a system uh, of shared responsibility. So uh, I've modernized the spelling, uh, uh, but uh, one of the quotes that comes out of the statute is that the goal of the statute is to make sure that landlords and tenants are proportionate in their sharing of the responsibility as a result of the fire. Uh, and uh, the difficulty, of course, then is 
exactly how do you do that? How do you proportionally share responsibility between landlord and tenant? And here, um, the, uh, the statute says, uh, well, we don't necessarily want to provide any general rule. Uh, so it creates this court composed of the 12 common law judges, any three of whom sitting together can, uh, uh, can uh, constitute a court. And uh, it tells the, uh, the judges, you um, figure out ways to uh, change the lease structures of the parties uh, so that uh, we can create an incentive to rebuild. So uh, the, uh, the legislation does a, a couple of things. It allows this fire court to extend leases by up to 40 years. Uh, so if, uh, again, let's just say, uh, Donald, that you had three years left on your lease, uh, the fire court could, in essence, uh, require that the landlord execute a new lease for you for uh, 43 years, or for out for you know, your remaining three plus another 40 years. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the court was allowed to adjust the rents uh, in a way that would, uh, and of course, usually by reducing the rent, you reducing your rent, adjust the rents in a way that would give you an incentive to rebuild the property. Um, so that's the way in which this, uh, this court works. It's a, in essence built on a principle of sharing the loss uh, between the tenant and the landlord, where both of them might bear some responsibility for uh, for this, and and of course in the process give a little money to whoever's the rebuilder to begin the process of reconstruction. Well, that uh, that, that sounds perfectly um, uh, innovative uh, into my mind. That isn't what one normally expects from. Uh, legislation in the 17th century. Uh, uh, There's a number of questions. Do, do, do we know who it was, who, who thought of this, who was the progenitor of this, uh, this act? So um, I, I don't, and I've, I've uh, uh, it, there are records that suggest uh, that who the people were in the city that were uh, uh, pushing this forward. Uh, it's usually said by historians that Matthew Hale, uh, probably who was at that time the, the chief baron of the exchequer, uh, probably uh, the greatest legal mind uh, in England at the time. Uh, there, there was, uh, the, the historians have generally attributed to Matthew Hale uh, some of the authorship of the Acts for the Rebuilding of London. And, and uh, I haven't, to my satisfaction, ever nailed down a source that demonstrates that clearly, although, and this would be an entirely uh, different and lengthier conversation, I, I will admit that I do see fingerprints uh, in the legislation that suggest that, uh, that uh, Matthew Hale might have had a, a significant role to play. But in, in your researches, have you found this to be entirely novel as an approach? Uh, it is. Um, uh, it is very much, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, quite a novel approach um, and uh, uh, in, in a number of different directions. Uh, obviously, the sharing of law, something that either the common law or equity likely would have done. One of the other interesting features about this legislation, uh, which I'd, I'd uh, forgotten to mention before, but it has a sunset provision in it. Um, uh, and so uh, this court it comes into existence in early uh, 1667 and is by statute to go out of existence by December 31st, 1668. But why, why would it do that? Because it wasn't an expensive court to run. It was a successful court to run. Uh, it seems to have been accepted by uh, the parties to the litigation. Uh, why would one need to um, have a sunset clause? I, might it be, uh, looking at it in its historic context, um, where, where not long after the restoration, might this be the, an echo of uh, people wanting to live at the power of the, the king, power of the state, or, or might it be a harking back to the so, seeking of certainty in the common law, uh, which wouldn't be uh, involved in the actions of the fire courts? What was the thinking behind it? So I, I've not been able to discern exactly uh, what the thinking was, but I, but I do like your logic. I, I, I do think that this was understood to be an unusual, I, I, the, the, the unusualness or the uniqueness of this particular court is reflected in the fact that there was a sunset clause uh, and that uh, uh, parliament recognizes, I, I won't call it necessarily the danger uh, of a court like this, but the, the way in which this court potentially could impinge on uh, the ordinary course of law and equity. So 
I, I have no doubt that that has a, a, a part of the reason why uh, the Lords particularly was concerned about this court. Uh, and so I have no doubt that the sunset provision is there at least in part to um, assuage concerns among those who were fearful of the power of this court. I, I'd like to come back in a moment to, to, to how the individual judge is going to be dealing with um, uh, a case in front of him. But let me, there are some other things I'd like to ask before then, if I may. Um, how did the fire court operate? Um, then as now, uh, lawyers are rarely the friends of uh, swift procedure and effective litigation. Um, what was the process uh, in the fire courts that was different from the courts of common law and, and equity? So you know, that's actually what really first attracted me uh, to, uh, to looking at this question uh, was uh, exactly uh, how did the courts operate? Because that's my own interest is in modern mass disasters. And I'm always fascinated in watching how courts uh, do their business. So um, uh, let me just give a little bit of a sense again, if I can uh, pull up a slide once again, just again to uh, something I've already said about the courts, uh, again, that any three or more of them uh, would be capable of constituting a court uh, or constituting the court. So uh, you know, that's, that's kind of the first aspect of the process of the court. Um, a couple of other things, uh, juries are discretionary, uh, except on, on certain matters of, evalu of valuing property in some of the later revisions of this act. Uh, uh, but generally speaking, uh, juries are discretionary. Uh, there can be appeals, but uh, not to the House of Lords. Uh, originally, there were to be no appeals whatsoever, uh, but then uh, the agreement ultimately is that there will be appeals, uh, but only to a larger body of the same group of 12 common law judges. So seven or more of these judges uh, could serve on an appeal. Uh, as an aside, uh, there were only, there were, uh, as I'll describe in a minute, there were nearly 1,600 uh, cases decided by the fire court, only eight appeals, uh, almost all of them in the early days. And uh, uh, this wouldn't surprise, but the uh, justices, uh, or the judges of the common law courts, when they would come together on appeal, always affirmed uh, the decision of the original panel. And so I think that very quickly became understood that there was little profit uh, in trying to appeal the decisions of the, of the, uh, the original panel of the fire judge court. Um, a couple of other things then, uh, just about the, just the procedure about how it went about doing its business. And this to me is aside from the rather radical nature of trying to split the baby, the Solomonic solution in terms of the substance of how the court was to resolve these disputes. The other thing that was radical about this court in many ways was that it operated, uh, and this is a language from the statute, uh, a sina forme at uh, um, a figura at judiciae, uh, and without the formalities or proceedings of either the courts of law or equity. Uh, that the Latin phrase I think best probably translates, I mean, uh, literally, of course, without the form and figures of the law or, or the, of the uh, judicial system, um, but uh, I think better translates as a sense of summarily. Uh, and that's exactly the way that the courts worked in this situation. They were quite summary. Uh, I want to come back and talk about that, give you some evidence about that in a little bit. Uh, but uh, it was an extraordinarily informal pr uh, process. Uh, it would just simply be a petition would be filed. Uh, parties would be summoned, and the next thing you would be would there would be a hearing before the judges, typically resolved on exactly that same day. So it was a very simple process. I mean, a, a kind of, a, if you will, a kind of a rough justice. Uh, uh, but that was contemplated by the statute itself. This was not to be run according to the ordinary procedures of common law and equity, which, of course, as we know, could be cumbersome. Uh, certainly, could be expensive. A couple of other things, just as small notes about the statute itself. Uh, no fees. Uh, so this is a time when judges are still earning a third or perhaps uh, of their income from fees charged in cases. No fees. Uh, are, uh, the judges agree to do this work pro bono or gratis. Uh, there are no fees charged by the, uh, on, on behalf of the judges themselves. And then last of all, I did mention this I, uh, before, I should have I, I said it before, but there is this sunset date of uh, 1668. Uh, now, it turns out, by the way, I should say, and I, I'm going to show you some figures in a minute, but uh, it, it turns out that the court is not done by 1668. This turns out to be such a popular court, and there is a, such a backlog of cases in this court that it can't get its work done by 1668. 
So the remaining cases just languish uh, until Parliament in 1670 authorizes uh, or reauthorizes the court for an additional year until 1671. But that's still not enough, uh, among other reasons, because in its reauthorization, or I said Congress, I think I meant Parliament. Uh, uh, um, uh, Parliament uh, expands the powers of the court, allows the court now to uh, provide leases up to 60 years, um, and uh, also expands the jurisdiction of the court so that now brings in other fires besides the Great Fire, uh, extended, uh, there are an extension of power that way. So the court is still not done uh, and, at, uh, and by February 1661. So parliament reauthorizes it again until February 16, uh, seven, 1672. Uh, and they're still not done. Uh, so, uh, so parliament finally uh, has a final reauthorization of the, of the statute uh, to February 25th, 1676. Uh, and uh, the very last case heard on uh, February 18th. 1676. So, uh, you know, the, the, the court goes on, but, I, you know, that goes back to the point I think you suggested, Donald, about, about uh, par why Parliament was reluctant. I mean, they're willing to continue to extend the court, even extend its power somewhat to include other fires because they recognize the value of this court, but they are reluctant to uh, see it into existence as a general matter going forward. Oh, that's uh, fascinating, but um, the um, 10 years to dispose of the whole of the work, um, but was it, was it front loaded? Did they manage to get through? Because we, we, we learned that London comes back very quickly. Um, it uh, begins to rebuild very quickly. And so um, did, did they get through the bulk of the work in the early years uh, and then just, as it were, park the difficult cases until later? How, how, how did that work? So um, let me... Um uh try to uh pull up something else here uh in just a second i mean but let me just first uh, begin by answering the question and then I'll, I'll i'll give you a slide so we do know something about uh these cases because part of the statute was that these cases were to be recorded permanently or to be uh housed permanently in the city of london so uh the way that it would work with these cases and this is how we know as much about the operation of the court uh, as we do um, is, uh, let me just uh, bring this over here quickly. Um, so uh, we, we still have the records of the court. Uh, now the records originally were uh, just simply transcribed on a, a, a paper parchment of the kind that you see that uh, should be up on the, on the screen right now. Uh, but then eventually what happens is that all of these uh, individual judgments or opinions, we would call them slip opinions in the United States, uh, all of these opinions are ultimately gathered together and put into uh, engrossed volumes, uh, nine of them all together, uh, which are still available uh, if you would wanted to see them at the London Metropolitan Archives. This happens to be, I think, the ninth of the, of the volumes. Um, so the, it's available, this, this information is available. Now there are some slight differences between the original copies, which you can find in the British Library uh, and the engrossed volumes, there's a few more opinions in the British Library that ultimately make their way into the engrossed opinions. But we know a great deal uh, about the work of the court uh, as a result of, uh, of, of these opinions. So um, let me just give you, again, just some quick thoughts on it. Uh, first of all, uh, 1,585 cases total uh, are decided by the fire court. Uh, now this applies to um, more than 1,500 individual properties. Many of these cases involve multiple properties where you have a tenant who has rented multiple properties from the same landlord. So my best guess, I've never tried to count the exact numbers, but my, my best guess is that these 1500 opinions uh, or 1585 opinions cover approximately 3000 to 3500 of the properties in London. Um, 17 of the cases involve other fires, uh, the fire, a fire in the Savoy, a, a, fire in Southwark, a fire up in the Navy Yard, uh, which had survived the, the, the Great Fire originally. So 17 of the cases involve other properties, but nonetheless, of roughly 1,570 of these cases involve uh, properties burned in the Great Fire. And, and they cover about 3,000 or about roughly, say, a quarter uh, of the total number of cases that are, or number of buildings that are burned in the, in the Great Fire. So it obviously touches uh, a great deal of the city. Now, 
in terms of just to give you a sense of workload, I think you'd ask Donald just what about the, the workload. Um, so this is of those 1,585 cases, this would give you a rough sense of uh, how the workload was distributed. Uh, I just the, the uh, by year, of course, I just counted the number of days in which the fire court sat. That would be the first column. Second column, uh, the number of cases decided in that year by the fire court. And then the third column, just averaging that out to give you a rough idea of per day, how many cases the fire court got its way through. Uh, and you see, of course, that first year, it's lower, um, about two, not quite three cases per day, which is, of course, still an extraordinary pace. Uh, but, uh, but not as much as you see by the next year, which we're up to 5.6 cases per day. And it more or less, you know, holds that way uh, to the end. The end, there are a few cases, there, there, there are a few straggler cases. Some of them are a little more difficult. Others, I think they just, they were just single cases decided on a single day. So the, you know, the, the disposition rate does drop off a little bit uh, near the end. But uh, the, you know, the, the, the message you should take is that the court is busy and it's disposing of a lot of cases per every day. It is, a, you know, in its way, as the statute requires, a form of summary justice. And it's a form of summary justice that is permissible only because of what the court is doing. Um, the court is often not adjudicating these disputes. Uh, oftentimes what it is doing rather is acting as either a mediator of the dispute, uh, trying to convince the parties, you know, uh, to the landlord, would you give a little on the rent, uh, you know, to the plaintiff, uh, would you come up a little bit on what you're offering in terms of, of the rent? Uh, so they were really typically acting as a mediator and, and usually the parties would come to agreement uh, in relatively, uh, you know, it, it would appear in relatively quick, quick order. And in addition to that, a lot of the parties came to the court with the agreement already settled. All they were doing was coming to court, asking the court, would you please bless this agreement that we've already come to out of court? So the court becomes much more, especially as it progresses from early days, where it is adjudicating more cases. But as it becomes clear what the pattern is and how the court is disposing of cases, it becomes much more of uh, a, a court of mediation uh, rather than a court of, let's say, adjudication. Jay, um, you were talking to a, a chart, which I'm afraid seemed not to come up on our screens. So oh, my goodness. I apologize. Let me, I, 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 you should have told me, I apologize. The technology is a, is a challenge, my, my apologies. Um, so uh, uh, these, are, this is the, these are the numbers that I, I had talked about before, uh, just so that you have a rough sense of the, uh, the kinds of, of um, you know, dispositions handled by the fire court. Um, one thing you'll notice is for, for the eagle eye, uh, the total number of cases is only uh, uh, 1,584. And you'll recall I said there were 1,585. Uh, one of the cases, the date is simply illegible uh, on the opinion. Uh, given where it likely falls, it's probably for 1670, but, uh, but I didn't want to ascribe a date to that opinion. So that's why there's a, a slight variance in the number. But after um, 1672, um, uh, the cases are in, only in double figures as opposed to triple figures. So clearly the bulk of that has been dealt with in that five year period. And indeed in the first uh, two years, um, about a thousand cases were, were dealt with. A thousand six, that's right. That's exactly yeah. right. Uh, and and, and uh, even in those, in those last few years, uh, as I had said, uh, in the last uh, roughly four years, uh, 17 of those cases are other fires. Uh, they're, not, they're not the great fire. So uh, it, it's cleanup work uh, by the very end of the operation of this court. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Jay, one of the things that um, as, a, as a judge I've been rather intrigued by um, is the idea that the uh, judges refused any fee. Uh, or perhaps they refused to pay the judge any fee. But um, in, in a time when judges were working, um, uh, their income came a lot from fees, as I understand it. Um, uh, how, how did it come about? How did that work? Were, were, were they particularly public spirited? What was the situation? Uh, so uh, I, I don't know how it came about. That, that's my impression. Yes, uh, I think that they uh, that they were public spirited. Uh, over the course of the nine years that the court sits, there are ultimately twenty two judges uh, of the common law and who will sit on this court. Uh, and um, the the only compensation that they received 
was uh, the city of London agreed to uh, commission a portrait uh, of each of the uh, judges who sat on the fire court. Ah, well, perhaps I can, can help there. I sometimes use this <laughs> virtual background, uh -huh. uh, uh, which actually is the, is the great hall of the Royal Courts of Justice. And if you look over each of my shoulders, there are two very large paintings of uh, 17th century judges. Uh, and they're two of the, um, uh, the 14 surviving uh, fire judge portraits. The, the others, we've got five of them in the inner temple. Uh, Lincoln's Inn's got five, and there are two in the uh, gallery of the, uh, uh, of the Guildhall still. Uh, and of course, as you know, um, those uh, pictures of the judges hung in the Guildhall for about 250 years until uh, the last war. Uh, and uh, then uh, they were removed, damaged and removed, sadly. Um, mm -hmm. But it's not often that uh, judges uh, uh, are so popular uh, that uh, massive portraits are painted and they're left uh, on public display for 250 years. Um, well, is it a sign of how well the whole, the whole thing was received, the, that their work was received? Yes, uh, one sign, uh, of course, among uh, among others, uh, but the cost of those portraits was nearly 50 pounds per portrait. So uh, the city put out over a thousand pounds uh, for those portraits. So uh, I, I think that's at least, you know, one indication uh, of the way in which uh, there was significant gratitude for the work that the judges had done. I should say, and, and of course it was uh, civic minded of all of the judges to, to do this work. Uh, there were um, variations uh, in the civic mindedness uh, of, of the judges. Uh, uh, some of them uh, sat quite a bit on the court. Some of them sat very little. Uh, for instance, in the first 339 cases, those would be the in the first two volumes uh, of the nine volumes of the engrossed records that are available. Uh, Justice Thomas Terrell, who was at that point already uh, older than 70, um, sat, I believe it was uh, uh, 156 times, uh, while um, uh, the, the uh, Lord Chief Justice of, uh, of Common Pleas, um, Orlando Bridgman, only sat 22 times. Uh, so uh, Matthew Hale sat quite a bit. Uh, he was, I think he was third uh, on the list in that initial group, but his participation falls off significantly over time. Uh, so uh, they weren't necessarily all uh, equally civic minded, although I don't want necessarily to ascribe to a lack of civic mindedness and as the only explanation for why some of the judges might not have been able to have uh, sat as much as some of the other judges. On a day-to-day -day basis, where, how did that court function? Where did it sit? What was it, what was it doing? Uh, did, it have, did it have counsel before it? What, what was it like? Uh, so uh, it sat at Clifford's Inn. Uh, the Clifford's Inn, uh, which was the oldest, uh, I believe, of the courts of chancery, or the Inns of uh, Chancery, and uh, I also, I believe, the last to be torn down back in the mid-1930s, uh, was right at the edge of the fire. Uh, so uh, the judges went to Clifford's Inn to conduct their business. Uh, and you know, I've always thought that was a, um, a, a, a quite a good place for them to have uh, conducted the court because at least in the early days, of course, as they would come into Clifford's Inn, they would see the work that lay before them. Uh, and then as time goes on and as London is largely rebuilt over the course of the next 10 years, they can continue to see how their work has contributed uh, to the development and the rebuilding of London. So it was a, a particularly good uh, place for them to, uh, to, to hold the court. Um, you'd mentioned, you talked about the bar. Uh, this was another way in which the uh, fire court was, uh, again, a rather uh, a simple court in its procedure. There was no requirement that anyone uh, come with counsel. Uh, and indeed in more of the earlier cases than not, people would appear without counsel. Um, what does end up happening, I think it's the fourth or the fifth case in was the first time you see counsel appearing. Uh, about the fourth or the fifth case in, uh, counsel start to appear. Uh, and then by the, near to the end of the fire court, counsel is in every case. Counsel is appearing in every case. Um, 
And so there does develop a bar uh, around the fire court. Uh, a few lawyers in particular are the repeat um, uh, players uh, in, in representing clients, uh, landlords and tenants. And, and one thing that I get a sense of, uh, and, and again, it's, it's only a sense from looking at the records, uh, whether it's the correct sense or not, I suppose is debatable, but um, the sense I get is how important the bar was to the functioning of the fire court and to the success of the fire court in the end. There are, it's clear even from the records themselves, there are an awful lot of cases that are settling in the shadow of the fire court. Uh, parties that are coming to agreement on uh, what terms should be, knowing how the fire court is going about its business. And, and undoubtedly the lawyers are the ones who are helping to guide uh, the parties to come to an agreement um, that's more or less in line with what the fire court would likely uh, would likely order. Um, I, I think the you know the professionalized bar uh, before the fire court really helps it to do its business and brings more people to the table willing to mediate their solution rather than to have the court try to adjudicate a solution before unwilling parties. Can you give us an example of a a, a typical case? Um, that, I mean, you, you, you've, you've read the records, you've researched, I mean, you've researched so many of them, but can, can you help us with a, an example that would give us a feel for what, what, what was happening? Yeah, so, um, I, you know, I, I knew you were going to uh, ask me to do something like that, so I, uh, I, I, I didn't know which case to pick because every case is unique and different. I mean, the, the, the arrangements, the length of the lease term left, whether it was a large fine was paid, whether it was a, a warehouse versus a massage, whatever, there are so many differences, it's almost impossible to pick uh, a, a representative case. So I just uh, put into my phone a random number generator and I picked out case number 435, uh, which is why, uh, so that's the case I'm, I'm gonna talk to you about. Uh, it's a case uh, uh, brought by the, uh, the master and wardens of the, uh, the mystery of the haberdashers against someone uh, named Farrington, as well as uh, two other tenants on the property. So it's a, this is a somewhat unusual case because it describes the property that was burned down as a capital massage. Uh, that's unusual, you know, in other words, one of the principal houses uh, in London, it was on Lombard Street. Uh, so it is a, a large dwelling. Um, the, uh, uh, the original rent or the, the lease on the property was in 1649 or uh, 1648, I apologize. Uh, it, the house had originally been owned by one of the Lord Mayors of London, who uh, on his death had given it to the haberdashers uh, and then, of course, the haberdashers had uh, had leased this out, and that's a, again a fairly common situation. You see a lot of the of the livery companies as uh, as parties in these cases. Um, but uh, the original uh, lease was for again for 29 years, uh, running so then until 1677. Uh, then there's also separate leases to, uh, to a sep another person to run what's called the Golden Fleece, which I assume must have been uh, an inn or tavern. Uh, and then uh, uh, yet another separate lease uh, to someone else for a shop and back shop is how it's described. Uh, the lease to uh, uh, Farrington, she's a widow, is for 40 pounds. It was also a fine that had been paid up front, uh, but it's for 40 pounds per year. Uh, and uh, for the Golden Fleece, it was 34 pounds a year. Uh, for the shop, it was 26 pounds a year. So that, those were the leases and they were all going to uh, go until 1677. So now, of course, the property is is uh, is burned down. This case, by the way, is uh, I think decided on April second, uh, 1668. Um, so uh, uh, the what the after much negotiation back and forth, uh, the, uh, uh, the the haberdashers agree uh, with the uh, the tenants that they will take uh, twenty five pounds from uh, Farrington for her interest in the capital massage as well as then 20 pounds from the other two, from the Golden Fleece, as well as from uh, the, the shop. Uh, by this time, of course, multiple people have died. So we have uh, executors and, and, uh, and successors in, in interest to the estate. Uh, but the lease is given now for 61 more years. Uh, it's, it's not, uh, so the, the lease now extends until 1729, where off of this property, the haberdashers will yield 45 pounds, or I'm sorry, I apologize, 65 pounds per year. Yeah, so there's um, a, a rent freeze for a year to allow the property to be rebuilt effectively. Oh, right. I, I forgot to mention that's an important part as well. And this was quite common with the court. 
they would not typically order the rent to be paid for uh, usually a year uh, from when the court would sit. And the, the understanding, I think, that is that what that meant was it was going to take about a year to rebuild the property. So the court would forgive arrears of rent from the Great Fire up until the date when the court thought that the property would be rebuilt. And so you, you get a pretty good idea about, uh, about how long the court thought rebuilding would take by looking at the time when the court would order the rent to begin to be paid again. And the figures approximately, there was a reduction of 35 uh, pounds a, a year, um, but over a, a very long time, six, 61 years. Um, that was in the early stages, as I understand it, um, before the legislation change. Uh, and at that point, was it not only, uh, was it not a limitation of 40 years on the court uh, as to the amount of time it could extend? Uh, yeah, well, that, that's a good catch. Uh, yes, it was. Uh, and you do see this occasion. I, again, this is just entirely random. Uh, tr literally luck, I pulled this case out of the stack. Uh, but um, occasionally the court would exceed the 40 years. By statute, it was allowed to extend the lease by 40. There were rare cases, and this just happens to have been one of them, uh, where uh, even before it's given the power to extend leases by 60 years, 61 years, uh, it it uh, it does nonetheless do so, and and I suspect that where it feels it has the ability to do so is that the parties ultimately agreed this deal. Um, so uh, of course it's always within the party's power to agree to a sixty one year lease, and so I don't know that the court necessarily felt that it was uh, violating the terms of its legislative authority by, in essence, approving this deal. But but it is interesting that yes, I mean I think the court sees here that you know this is this is a large home. It's going to take a long time to recoup the investment uh, of building a, a home like this, as well as the shop in the inn, and it's willing to give quite an extensive lease to allow the tenants that time to to recoup their investment. Well, of course, it was also manifestly achieving the primary, um, the paramount ob objective of the court to, to to get on and get it done. And, and you know that's the striking thing about when you read these decisions, decision after decision. Uh, some of it is, and I, you know, I know we've talked on this is not a, a phrase in common use in, in perhaps on, on, on your side of the Atlantic. Uh, it was it was boilerplate. In other words, it was just sort of words uh, that were that would find their way into every one of these opinions. So it was to some extent just words. But one of the things you're struck by as you read these decisions is how case after case recites the purpose of this legislation is to adjust the differences to find uh, the most rapid means of trying to rebuild the city of London. And, and oftentimes what that meant would be that the tenant would be the one who would be given the lease. Um, sometimes though, uh, the tenant either didn't want to continue the lease, in some instances they'd left London, uh, in other instances, they, they had literally been ruined by the fire and had absolutely no money with which to rebuild. Uh, so in those instances, then the court would order the lease suspended or would, would terminate it, uh, and then would give the property back to the landlord for the landlord to rebuild. But the, the court was always, through all of its decisions, looking for who could best rebuild this property most quickly and then sent it, setting up an incentive structure to make that happen. So if it was the landlord who could build more quickly, then sometimes the tenant would be required to make a contribution to the landlord. Uh, if on the other hand, the, the tenant was the one who really wanted to rebuild the property, uh, then the landlord would be required to in essence, give some incentive to the tenant by reducing the rent and by extending the term of the lease. The hard cases were the cases where both the defense, both the landlord and the tenant wanted to, to rebuild. Uh, and there were a number of cases that were like that. Usually the landlord had in mind a somewhat grander project. They wanted to rebuild the house in a larger way, or they had other properties nearby and they wanted to combine the properties into some uh, grander design. One of the striking things about the way the court operates, so it, it, uh, it says more than once that no case should be regarded as a precedent for another case. Nonetheless, um, it, it recites with some frequency what I guess you might call a presumption, uh, and that is if both the landlord and the tenant want to rebuild, uh, the presumption goes to the tenant, uh, that generally speaking, the goal was to put people back into possession uh, of property that they had, um, rather than necessarily to try to construct a different London, trying to as closely as possible reconstruct the London that had burned. They, um, 
in, in the case you've, you cited, the haberdash is a case, of course, you, you can see that um, you have there an institution that had been around for hundreds of years prior to the fire and probably thought it would be around for hundreds of years after the fire. Um, what proportion of the city was owned by large institutions like that, by the city itself, by the king, by delivery companies? So, uh, you know, it's, I haven't looked at every property record, of course, at the time. Uh, you know, the, the, the standard view is the, the city itself owned about a quarter of the property in London. That's that's the, the figure I've, I've seen other historians uh, uh, refer to. Uh, and and again, and also derived about a quarter of its revenue from, um, uh, from those leases. Uh, when you look through the fire court records, um, it is quite common uh, that on the one side you have the tenant in possession or maybe just the tenant above the tenant in possession willing to rebuild. And on the other side, you have great institutions. You have uh, the Dean and Chapter of St. Paul's is a very common litigant. Uh, the livery companies are very common litigants. Uh, but what, another thing that's quite interesting is you, uh, other parts of, uh, of uh, England also hold uh, property in London. So you have uh, the city of Shropshire, for instance, uh, has a number of properties that apparently have been given to it over the years uh, by citizens of Shropshire, I guess. And so you see them appearing. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, you, uh, it's, I haven't ever actually run those numbers, but my rough guess would be that in the opinions themselves, it's probably around a third or so uh, of the cases involve what you would call you know, an, an institutional uh, landlord, uh, someone who can play that long game, as you suggested. Um, you know, but in, of course, other cases uh, where you didn't have that kind of a, 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 an ability to play the long game, there's no doubt that this attempt to try to um, adjust the differences, to split the differences between the parties, created hardships. I mean, in the long run, it's a win-win, uh, because at some point in 40 or 60 years, the landlord will get back a much better building than the one that had been leased before. Uh, but it, it is true that not every landlord can afford to play the long game. The judges um, was in an unusual position for common law judges. But they seem, from what you were saying, to be rather more um, mediators and arbitrators than they would have uh, normally have expected to be, uh, to find themselves in a position to be in the, in the 17th century. Um, what, at the end of the day, what were the, the criteria that they were able to, to use for making their decisions? It intrigues me as a judge, there's very little um, legislative guidance, apart from this guiding princi principle of rebuilding. So how would a judge, how would the judge know how long to extend a lease for? How long would a judge, if, if a decision has to be made as opposed to just mediation, um, uh, how would he know how much to reduce the rent by? Um, what were the what were the guiding principles that came here? So the uh, finances, of course, in its infancy. Um, Rents in London are all over the place. There isn't really a, a you know, I think at this sense yet a, a sense of sort of a common market or what the market would bear in terms of rents. So you see in the rents that are described in the fire courts records, properties that sound quite similar, but with extraordinarily different rent structures uh, and amounts of money involved. Um, I've never been able to determine precisely um, what principle guided the fire court judges. Um, however, uh, so there is a book uh, written by a fellow by the name of St Stephen Primet, uh, uh, in, in the second edition of which is published in 1667 and dedicated to the three uh, chief just judges of the common law courts uh, and uh, claiming in his introduction that I'm glad that you have found my book useful and I'm essentially uh, bringing it up to date. Uh, so it contained within that book are charts uh, for what appropriate rents would be and how to value rents, uh, uh, how to value, uh, let's say, if you have 10 years left on the term of a rent, uh, how, how to value that. Uh, so um, I, my guess is, and this is just work I've never yet been able to do, my guess is if you were to plot the, the way in which the fire court works in those cases in which it must make a decision, um, if you were to plot that against what is in going on in Primit's book, you would probably find some correlation. So uh, to the extent there's uh, guidance, I, I, I think it's coming out of that treatise. Uh, it's not, as you said, not coming from the legislation. Jay, this has been a fascinating discussion. Um, I'd like to move on in the, in the latter part of it to considering what lessons we might draw from uh, 
the fire courts to the present day and the situation we find ourselves in. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you've been giving some consideration to that. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> As I said, that's, that's, you know, what has fascinated me about this court. But, but now with the crisis that we face, um, so, well, certainly this side of the, uh, the Atlantic, and I suspect it's much the same with your, your side, is there anything that uh, we need to, to take hold of and say, look, um, we can lift it from there into, into our, our, our present uh, woes and difficulties? Well, a, a couple of thoughts, and again, I'd, I'd love to hear people's comments on this as well. Um, but a couple of thoughts. I mean, first of all, uh, you know, I, I have wondered how it is that the fire court um, is as successful as it is. And it is universally regarded as being a great success, so successful that parliament resorts to fire courts again over the course of the next 150 years with other urban fires. Um, you know, what made it successful? Uh, and and, I, and I, I have a couple of ideas uh, now how they uh, map onto our present situation, I think, is the matter of debate. But one of them is the single-minded purpose of this court. It, it, it had a single, simple purpose, rebuild London as quickly as possible. Uh, and so it had that mission um, which it, from which it never faltered uh, that I think helped it to be successful. Uh, it was limited in scope and scale. Uh, I'm, uh, 1,585 cases is no small number, uh, but at the same time, it's something that you could imagine being manageable. Uh, it had a lot of buy-in, it seemed, from major uh, players, uh, the king, the city, and uh, the bar, and ultimately, I think, a lot of the litigants that they saw the good that was coming of it. And the other thing about it is that it, 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 was, it was a win-win situation. It was perspective, right? It wasn't simply trying to compensate people for some th awful thing that had happened in the past, uh, some past disaster. Um, it was perspective in its nature. And it held out the prospect, not that every single landlord or tenant uh, received, the, received the ben this benefit, but it held out the prospect of being a win-win situation where both the, the, the tenant would get a reduction in rent and the uh, landlord would get a better building, if, again, being patient and waiting 61 years for it, so perhaps your descendants would get it rather than you. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, in that sense, a win-win situation. So I think there are certain aspects of our present situation that we face where that same sort of, uh, you know, that same idea about trying to find a way to split the difference might might be useful. And 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 that to me is the critical thing about the court is is the um, the what, what lay behind it, the inspiration behind it, uh, to when you recognize that law is uh, not an appropriate way to try to allocate loss, uh, the laws that exist puts too much loss on one side or the other. Let's find a way, um, again, in these situations where we can create win-win results, let's find a way to try to split the difference and, and, and make everybody bear a, a fair share of what's a truly unexpected and unanticipatable crisis. Sure. Well, those are just a few thoughts that I have. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. And, and I, I think those are matters that have got to be carried on from today. And we've got to think, think further through on them. Um, I, myself, um, have, have wondered a number of, I mean, the situation we find ourselves in now um, a, in, in this country is uh, we have a, a huge crisis in the landlord and tenant market, for example, uh, both domestic commercial uh, and uh, retail. Um, people are in real difficulty paying their rent. Um, there are temporary solutions being found in terms of deals between landlords and tenants going on. There are um, uh, solutions being found in preventing evictions uh, in, in the short term, but that can't go on forever. Uh, and something needs to be done to uh, regularize the situation. Uh, we, we've got a number of questions come in during the course, well, quite a lot of questions have come in during the course of uh, your talk. Um, sure. There's one um, here from uh, uh, Stenning, um, which says, uh, aside from the recent Nightingale courts to deal with uh, COVID, uh, what are the chances of a similar fire court arrangement uh, happening here? Uh, and if they were to rise again, what would you uh, think that would uh, they, they would be made for. Uh, the Crown Court backlog is approximately 50,000 cases. I wasn't aware that it was as much as that. Uh, and the magistrate's backlog is another 500,000 cases. Uh, is that not good enough reason for there to be fire courts uh, once again? 
Um, could they translate away from just private law disputes into public law disputes and, and greater efficiency sought in those areas? So I, I think there has to be a, a willingness to be committed to this very rough justice to begin with. Um, you know, these disposing of cases at the rate of six a day is is uh, you know I mean that, that, that's that's what you, you would have to find the uh, the judicial people power I would imagine for this. I mean, if, if indeed the backlogs are already at that level, simply um, taking a group of those judges and dedicating them to uh, you know to something like a fire court that doesn't aid with the backlog. So I don't know, I mean, given that this process ultimately becomes more of a mediation process, a conciliation process, a settlement process, uh, it becomes very 20th, 21st century looking kind of a process back in the 17th century. I don't know, uh, you know, whether or not there might be resources to expand uh, mediation efforts in this area. Um, because you know, I think you'd mentioned moratoriums. So moratoriums are uh, the equivalent in fire court terms of simply uh, during the period before the rebuilding of the property, no rent would be paid, right? I and mean, no rent was typically ordered by the fire court during that period. But I think there's a recognition, as you said, Donald, at some point, um, you, 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 you can't expect landlords to continue along that way forever. Uh, so there would have to be some way of making adjustments uh, something in between and and it, you, I'm sure you're talking about what a, a million uh, two million leases or whatever you're going to require significant people power to accomplish what the fire courts did I would think uh, yeah. good work for retired judges I would imagine well I'm always keen on work for retired judges um, <laughs> but uh, we've got another interesting question on an entirely different tangent here from um, uh, Stephen Cornish um, which um, is effectively asking about the work of the fire courts uh, in the broader context of what was happening in the city. I'll read the question. Um, didn't Wren and Hook have a major role in the Rebuilding Act based upon the work of the Rebuilding Commission uh, headed by Inigo Jones uh, in an earlier period in London's West End? Um, of course, the, the fire courts were not the only people sorting out boundary disputes and the like. Um, how did they relate to those? Right, I, you know, I, uh, again, in the time we had, I, I sort of left entirely aside the work of the surveyors, um, you know, Oliver, Hook, Mills, uh, in particular, uh, uh, and their extraordinarily important work uh, in, in the rebuilding of London. So uh, it's, it's uh, one thing to be able to say as a matter of law, how to adjust the interests in a piece of property. It's another thing to actually find that piece of property uh, and then to begin you know, to understand, you know exactly where that property is and to begin to the rebuilding of it. And that's one of the reasons why uh, some people doubted the ability to rebuild London. There was a fairly uh, broad recognition that before you could rebuild London, you needed to know exactly where the property boundaries were and exactly what were the property interests with respect to that property. So uh, yes, that's right. Uh, uh, the initial commission established, the Royal Commission established uh, after the Great Fire uh, does include um, uh, surveyors, some uh, appointed by the king, some by the city. I think there are a total of six. Uh, but their first job is to try to um, you know, begin to get a, a sense of where are the property boundaries. The relationship between the fire court and the surveyors was typically this. Uh, you needed uh, to have uh, a survey in order to rebuild. Uh, so once the fire courts sorted out who was going to do the rebuilding, you would then go to the surveyors and say, I'm the rebuilder. Uh, they would then survey the property. Uh, and then you would begin your rebuilding. Um, so uh, some of the records of the surveyors yet survive and there is a way and indeed um, some of that work has been done uh, by a man named Philip Jones about 50 years ago with regard to some of the fire court records. And again, I, Ian Doolittle today, I don't know if Ian's on this uh, or not, is I believe continuing that work. Uh, you can correlate uh, the properties described in the fire court uh, with the uh, surveyor's records in some instances to, to see exactly what which property it is that's at stake in this case. Reverting to the sunset clause, there's, there's an interesting suggestion uh, in one of the questions and observations that's come in. Um, I don't know what you think of it. Uh, could the sunset clause be just a way of getting tenants and landlords 
to sort out their responsibilities as soon as possible. Mm. Therefore, get on with rebuilding them. Uh, interesting question. Interesting observation. Uh, right. Uh, um, you know, not not to drag this out. I, I mean, I, I, there there could be some truth in that. Again, the 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 entire drive of this was to rebuild London as quickly as possible. And I, I hadn't thought of that, but sure. Uh, if you just create a court with um, an unlimited duration, uh, you could see uh, matters languishing. Uh, in fact, uh, when you take a look at, uh, not, nothing focuses you like a deadline. Uh, and I didn't mention this before, but when you take a look, of course, 1668, when the deadline is quick approaching, is the year in which the most cases are determined, I think 717 in all. The single day on which the most cases were decided, there were 28 cases decided on the uh, 14th of December. And I think the second most was 26 cases on the 22nd of December. So you see the fire court really working uh, beyond overtime when they know the deadline is there uh, to try to get these cases resolved. Two people asked, and I think the answer now is probably clear from what you said, but there are two questions about why there were no cases in, in 1669. Am I right in my understanding that that was simply because the sunset clause had kicked in and the parliament hadn't reacted uh, and repassed the legislation? That's right, that's exactly right. Uh, so 1669, the, the, the sunset clause has kicked in, the fire court goes out of existence and it's not until 1670 when parliament uh, reauthorizes the statute. So there's just no cases heard in 1669. Uh, and I, I, I don't want to fault Parliament for that too much. Uh, if you were to take a look at what's happening in 1669, Parliament was in session in 1669 only for a few weeks. Uh, so, uh, and there was other, and, and they passed no legislation in that session in 1669. Uh, so uh, the fire court shouldn't feel especially um, um, uh, disrespected in that regard. Uh, Parliament didn't do any legislating in 1669. It's essentially, as soon as it, it did come back into legislating in what was its eighth session in 1670, it does pass this legislation fairly rapidly. We know the judges weren't paid. Was it a completely free court? We have a, we have a question. Um, was, was there a filing fee? Uh, for the parties coming before the court, or was it completely free? Not meant, not that it was mentioned. I don't find any um, um, uh, mention of it in the records. Obviously, you would have to pay for your survey at the, you know, at the back end of the process before the fire court. Um, but I did not. I've never seen any references made to um, to filing fees. Now, a summons needed to be issued. Uh, it was a simple process to to call a defendant before the court, and I'm assuming that, um, uh, and, and of course, that had to be proven that the summons had been served. So I'm assuming that those who served the summons perhaps uh, received a certain amount of payment. Uh, there were other uh, expenses of running the court. I, I'm at most particularly the expenses of uh, the transcribers, uh, those who had to actually uh, do the court records and then of course uh, engross the court records in a, on parchment for the city. Uh, and the city of London paid those expenses. They paid all of the expenses for the parchment for the uh, for the, uh, the, the scriveners, uh, all that was handled out of the budget of the city of London. So I've, I've not seen any evidence, although, I, you know, perhaps someone who knows much more about it than I do, if, if anybody did, I'd love to know, but uh, I have not seen evidence that there was a filing fee. There's a, an interesting, um, a number of interesting questions uh, about the type of um, uh, party that came before the court. One particular aspect I, I think is intriguing um, and it may be that it isn't something that you've analyzed the, um, the records for, but um, there's a question that are, are there cases that give any insight into the role of women in the finance and trade in London? So uh, you're, you're right in the sense that I haven't formally uh, investigated um, uh, that question, but one of the things that is striking is that the number of women who are litigants actually uh, in the fire court. Um, uh, sometimes uh, a man will represent them. For instance, uh, among the litigants in the fire court was uh, uh, Lord Chief Justice uh, uh, Kellynch, uh, who is in the fire court representing his wife, who had, a, by inheritance, had inherited one of the properties that had burned down. Uh, so it was effectively uh, the, the landlady of the, of the property. Um, so uh, sometimes uh, you will see a man um, step in um, and say, you know, I'm, I'm the husband of the person who has this interest and therefore uh, speak for uh, uh, the woman. Uh, 
but uh, so often not. Uh, there are many cases that involve widows. Um, and so I, I, unfortunately, I could not give a precise percentage, but um, I would estimate, and this is just a, a very rough figure, I, I really would wanna go back and check to be precise, but uh, 20, 25% uh, of the cases involve women who are appearing essentially in their own name. Um, uh, person, perhaps? Pardon me? Uh, oh, yes, and in person. Yes, that's correct. Uh, people would uh, uh, appear in person before this court almost always. If, if the person didn't show up, the court would kick the uh, case over to the next uh, sitting where it could hear the case. Yes, the women would appear personally. Uh, and there's some uh, interesting cases along that line, by the way. There's cases, for instance, where a, a husband and a wife had split, and, and perhaps divorced, and the husband would argue that uh, all the, the wife had no interest in the property, and this was just an attempt by the wife to extort alimony from the husband, uh, and the uh, fire court had no jurisdiction over, uh, over the awards of alimony. So you would get into some of those kinds of disputes occasionally uh, in the fire court. Uh, but, um, uh, but generally, uh, you know, women would appear, when they, when they were the party, they would appear on their own, yes, for quite often, uh, or, or through counsel, but it would be clear from the records that they would be in court. And um, the socioeconomic profile of the parties. We know that the big institutions, the big corporations, um, are, are there, to, to, to use a slightly American phrase, ordinary Joes uh, <laughs> coming, coming before the court? You, um, you, you get that impression, yes. Uh, again, I, you know, I, I've actually done a little genealogical research on some of the litigants just, just to see if, uh, uh, what I could find. I, I've been working on the Southwark Fire Court records as a, the Great Fire of Southwark is in 1676, and, um, uh, and I've been working on those records more recently. Uh, uh, and there I've done more genealogical research. And uh, uh, so there it was very often, um, it was the brewers, uh, the innkeepers, uh, people like that, uh, if you will, just the ordinary Joes that were running a business that would, uh, or their widows, uh, that would often appear as the litigants there. Um, I haven't done as much work over on the with the Great Fire, but but yeah, certainly the descriptions of the uh, uh, usually the tenants, the tenants in possession, uh, as you said, the defendants are the landlords are often larger institutions. Uh, but the tenants in possession, the, the the description of them usually is you know they they have a shop, um, they're just uh, ordinary tradespeople. Um, you don't get the impression that they are all at least um, uh, those in the Great Society in, in London. Yeah. Uh, another question uh, about the jurisdiction of the court vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, other courts. Um, we, we, we know that um, uh, the, the fire courts are created, as I understand it, as a, as a, a, a bubble on their own, with their own appellate system, etc. But if one had, if one was a tenant and one had a dispute with uh, the landlord about the property that wasn't directly perhaps related to the Great Fire or tangentially related to the Great Fire. Could one take one's litigation elsewhere? Was that done? Uh, or or were, were the fire court such a tempting place to go to because they were quick and cheap and people went there? It was, an, uh, uh, so it was tempting. Uh, and there are a few cases where there are there are arguments about the jurisdiction of the fire court, whether the, the fire court had jurisdiction to resolve the particular dispute that's in play. Uh, um, my impression, again, in, in reading the decisions is that certainly uh, there were landlords at the time the fire court uh, is constituted. There are, are already landlords who are bringing suit in uh, at law against their tenants. Uh, and um, there are a certain number of those cases where, you know, again, every case is unique and different, but there are a certain number of those cases where the fire court, in essence, washes its hands of the case uh, and says, uh, we'll handle this much of it. Now you two go back to law uh, to settle whatever differences remain between the two of you. So um, again, you know, we, we talked about why this was so, such a successful court. And one of the reasons why is because of that laser focus on rebuilding London. And to the extent that the disputes between the parties really were not involved with the rebuilding of London, the fire court tended to wash its hands of those disputes. There's a, a, a question, um, which I think is, is, is interesting, but possibly rather, rather, rather a large one for, for us. Um, were, were there decisions of the court um, where um, 
the constitutionality of the legislation, the, the fundamental uh, validity of the legislation was ever challenged. Um, again, as I said, there were uh, several challenging the, uh, the jurisdiction of the court. Um, so in that That's sense, the validity of legislation. But, but, but right, but in terms of just simply challenging the validity of the legislation, uh, not, no, uh, that is, uh, I, I, other than, you know, occasionally arguing that uh, your power does not extend to me, uh, which, you know, you might uh, characterize as a constitutional challenge, we, we might here in the States. Uh, but, uh, but just in terms of the, the legislation itself is beyond the powers of parliament to enact, that challenge was never made. Uh, within the fire court system, that, that, that at least that I, that I have a record that any records would reflect that it was made. We spoke a little earlier about the work being being done by others in terms of setting the boundaries and, and, and the like. Um, we have um, a question uh, about the interrelationship between these sort of rather fluid boundaries and the fact that new streets are being created and the like through the city, as we know. So what was rebuilt wasn't entirely on the same footprint. And the question is, did the courts always abide by existing boundaries or could they adjust boundaries? What happened when roads were widened um, uh, over existing boundaries? Uh, how, do, how did the, the, the fire courts deal with, with, with that? And you tend to see that question arising more in some of the later cases, which is, I think, one of the reasons why, uh, you know, those straggler cases at the end, they, they take a little longer to resolve uh, sometimes. Uh, so, yes, you do see this issue uh, arising. And again, in other parts of the fire court legislation and in the reauthorization, Parliament is, is aware of the fact that, um, that the widening of the streets is going to lead to the loss of some property. So it does create a system by which property owners whose property is, is taken from them uh, can obtain compensation from the city of London. And a, a coal tax is passed in essence to fund um, this, uh, this system of what we would call eminent domain where, where property is taken. Um, the, the, where the fire court would though it sometimes become involved would be, uh, let's say uh, most of the property was taken, but then there would just be this small scrap that would remain. Uh, and it would really be too small to build on. Uh, but uh, of course, somebody, maybe the next door neighbor would love to have had that piece because then they could have made their house a little bit larger. So you see uh, the fire court occasionally getting involved in these cases about what to do with these scrap bits of land. Uh, and, and again, following its, its, you know, its pole star principle, uh, uh, how, what's the best way to rebuild the city? It would occasionally um, order land, some small bit of land to be given to whoever was the nearby property owner that could make the best use of it. Uh, it would then refer the matter over to uh, the city and to a jury in the city to determine what the value of that land would be. Uh, but once the jury had returned its verdict, then it would come back to the fire court and the fire court would decide uh, who now would uh, be entitled to that land going forward. Well, that must have acted, the jury must have acted fairly quickly in those circumstances. Yeah, it seems it seems so. Yeah, the references over to the jury seem to be quick, and, and again, uh, it, uh, the, the, they come back to the to the fire court uh, relatively quickly. And it's a very simple question the jury needs to answer, which is what's the value of this piece of property? And it's a, a question that juries have been asking um, for some time because, uh, again, of the widening of the streets and the loss of property values. Uh, or the taking of property for the widened streets uh, and so forth. So uh, it, you know, juries in London at that time were, I think, fairly well versed in making quick determinations of value. Would, would that have been in my old court, the mayor, mayor of city in London court, the mayor's court in the city, or would it have been one of the, one of the royal courts? that, that... Uh, It would have been the city, I'm trying to remember, uh, 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 court, of, court of Aldermen, I believe. Uh, right. I, I, I believe that's uh, that was uh, where the uh, the valuations were held. I, I I shouldn't be quoted on that broadly, but I believe it was the court of aldermen. Now I think this is probably the last question, um, uh, and uh, it's always one's friends who who stump one. Um, and this this question is actually asked by a friend of mine who isn't a lawyer at all, uh, but uh, he, he's a retired dentist. Uh, so so it comes from left field. And I'm not too sure I know the answer. Um, what, what he asks is, was there anything similar uh, in London after the Blitz? 
um, the implication being that um, when the city was laid waste, as we all see these devastating photographs, what happened then? And why wasn't a fire court created? Because the Fire Courts Act wasn't repealed until um, 1948, I think. But nobody, there was, no, there was no discussion, do you know? I don't, I'm afraid. Uh, well, there was no discussion of set, setting fire courts up to deal with uh, war damage of that nature. Well, that was the War Damage Commission, perhaps, that dealt with it. Uh, well, I, uh, so that's a wonderful question, and I, I, um, I, I do not know the answer to it. Um, uh, I must say that it's a question that, uh, that intrigues me and uh, may give me reason to come back to London again uh, to conduct this research on another period in English history. Uh, and if so, I'll be very happy to come back and talk about that another day. But um, uh, you know, I, I know we're, we're coming to the end of this, uh, Donald, and I just wanted to, uh, to thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you about this and to thank the Selden Society uh, and the History Societies of the Inns of Court for this opportunity to talk about what has become one of the loves that I have uh, in the research that I do. Well, the, th the thanks is absolutely ours. It's, uh, this is the first in this series of um, public lectures uh, to uh, increase interest in uh, legal history. Uh, and you've made it a, a huge success. The numbers who are still present uh, at seven o'clock at night, having been with us for an hour and a half, demonstrate that clearly. Uh, I'm very grateful to everybody's interest for being here. Next year, uh, the plan is to have uh, a, a lecture on Selden himself, uh, and it will be take place partly in the temple church where he's buried. Uh, and of course, now that we've learned the lessons of how to make these uh, talks uh, internationally available, it will be online. And I hope you will all join us uh, again next year. Thank you all very much indeed. Uh, and uh, we're uh, looking forward to seeing you uh, virtually or in the flesh next year. Uh, but most of all, uh, thank you, Jay, for uh, a fascinating evening. Oh, thank you. Bye now.